My name is Paul Shelley, welcome to the Astro Historian, and welcome to the lore tours of IAE 2952. Join me on the floor for your tour. Welcome to the complete compilation of the lore tours of the floor of IAE. In this video, we cover every single day, talk about all the manufacturers and their ships that were available on the floor. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the lore of the ships and manufacturers of IAE 2952. Drake Interplanetary was founded by a team headed by Jan Dredge, who built an entry for the UEE Volksfighter contest to design a low-cost, configurable space fighter that could be constructed rapidly to outfit distant home defense squadrons in time of need. While they lost out to the Wildcat, the team's entry, which would be known as the AS-1 Cutlass, had shown tremendous promise as a civilian multi-purpose frontier fighter. The team incorporated as Drake Interplanetary, simply because the name was smooth sounding, in 2845, and purchased the decaying former UEE Navy shipyards in Magnus on Berea. This instantly gave them the reputation of being underdogs for underdogs, and soon their sales would boom. This outlaw persona made them very unpopular with the UEE, who have shunned Drake's attempts to producing any ships for the military, and even banned them from showing any ships at Invictus celebrations. In response, Drake created DefenseCon with the tagline, after the fleet departs, who's left to protect you? Deliberately antagonizing the UEE military and doubling down on their outlaw persona. Unfortunately, the same cheap and easy to maintain capabilities of Drake ships that made them so popular with those on the frontier made them popular with outlaws as well. By 2947, two thirds of all pirate ships were cutlass blacks. There was rumors that Drake either intentionally sold the pirates or didn't care. So in April of that year, the Terra Gazette sent an undercover reporter to look into the rumors. This reporter would eventually get Jan Dredge to admit on camera that she didn't care who was buying their ships. This led to the forced retirement of Jan Dredge and the appointment of Andon Arden, who's renowned for being a fixer in the aerospace industry. He does have a bit of a bad reputation though, as the last company he helped shepherd was Waldeval Aerospace, which was absorbed by Art Corp, with him and the board members getting fat paychecks from the deal while the employees below them got nothing but fired. Today, Drake continues to be one of the largest and most successful manufacturers of ships in the UEE, with the Cutlass and its variants being some of the most used ships in history. Now, let's start our tour with the venerable Cutlass itself. First built in 2845, the AS-1 Cutlass was the beginning of Drake Interplanetary. The idea was to turn their rugged frontier military design into a civilian design for frontier militia groups, believing that with the Vanduul raids intensifying and the military still reorganizing from the fall of the Mezzers, these often overstretched and under-equipped forces would welcome a cheap and easy to maintain ship of the Cutlass's caliber. They had no idea how right they were. Within nine months of initial sales, Drake had opened six additional off-world factories and had licensed dealerships in nine systems. By the next year, the company had quadrupled in size. By 2850, Drake was the fifth largest spacecraft manufacturer in the UEE and literally couldn't license subsystem manufacturers fast enough. However, by the mid 29th century, the UEE looked to be in an age of unprecedented peace. As a result, pirates began to be the main customers of the ship. Cut off from normal insurance systems, pirates saw the cheap and replaceable Cutlass as the perfect solution to their problems. Drake didn't ask too many questions, so by the mid-30th century, the Cutlass had become the symbol of crime in the verse. Drake tried to dampen his reputation by releasing security version of the ship known as the Cutlass Blue in 2860, with only minor success. They followed it by creating the unusual version of the Cutlass, the Red, which was designed as an ambulance with advanced medical treatment beds and a surprisingly powerful long-range scanner. In a strange twist of fate, the Red was so good at its job that it became the standard ambulance for much of the verse, with even the UEE Navy buying 300 of them to use for ambulances on planet-side military hospitals. The same Navy that had rejected and continues to snub Drake has now begun to purchase the very ship they deemed unworthy of their support. The last Cutlass variant is the most recent one, the Steel. Designed as a combination dropship and gunship, it can hold 18 passengers in full armor and their weapons, allowing for a cheap troop transport which uses the same parts as the venerable Cutlass line, being a great addition to a frontier militia already equipped with ships like the Black, Blue, and Red. This leads us to the next ship that Drake built, the Caterpillar. Built in 2871, the Caterpillar was an attempt to do two things, 
diversify away from combat-focused cutlasses, and to take advantage of the cargo crisis of the 29th century. With the fall of the Mezzers, many ship and part manufacturers disappeared overnight, their close connections to the tyrannical Mezzers being a death sentence. As a result, there was a massive shortage of cargo ships in the 29th century, with the success of Crusader, Misk, and even Origin being thanks to this issue, all releasing ships to help mitigate the crisis. Jan Dredge wanted a non-combat ship to steer the company away from the toxic accusations of selling to criminals. The Caterpillar got a lot of negative press early on for being an older design, but that was overshadowed by its unique modular cargo bays and its jaw-dropping, inexpensive status compared to its competitors. Even its main command station was detachable with its own quantum drive and life support on board, making it very easy to transfer cargo loads in deep space if needed. Unfortunately, the ship would also gain an infamous reputation, as the Kesherling heist of 2903 showed that the Caterpillar was indeed capable of being an effective pirate ship. On May 21st, a Caterpillar broke out from heavy traffic and rammed a transport ship laden with goods, using its front sensor arrays as hooks to ground it. Boarders quickly leaped from the front of the ship, overwhelming security and grabbing their ill-gotten goods before retreating back to the Caterpillar, detaching the command module and slipping away forever. The next ship in Drake's fleet isn't really a ship. By 2882, Drake wanted to begin to synergize much of its existing fleet together, setting out to build ships that complement one another. Their first endeavor in this new enterprise was not actually a ship, but a combination of a snubcraft and a hover transport, the Dragonfly. The Dragonfly was built to operate in surface and space, carrying a crew of two and or one driver and cargo. Its size was designed specifically to be able to fit inside both the Caterpillar and Cutlass, to allow for further ranges for crew when landed or when the crew needed a smaller ship to navigate cluttered debris fields. The next ship is sure to be the star of this year's IAE and has a colorful past. In August of 2895, the Misk freighter Empire Slipper went off course and disappeared while carrying precious minerals and priceless art. It was found eight months later in a highly irradiated area and lodged in a dense cluster of asteroids, meaning no ship was small enough with enough protection to retrieve the vessel. Misk offered 10 million credits to anyone who could recover the black box of the ship, to which Drake answered the challenge. Drake used an experimental cutlass known as the Vertical Landing Test 3, fitted with salvage arms. The ship was overshielded and underpowered, but small enough to make it into the area and durable enough to survive the radiation. The crew of two then used the salvage arms to cut into the ship bit by bit to retrieve the flight data. However, when they turned it into Misk, their rival refused to pay them the bounty. Misk even took Drake to court, claiming they had covertly accessed copies of the logs before passing it along. The ship became famous, however, as the public had grown fascinated with the mysterious fate of the Empire Slipper. So Drake sent the ship on tour to aerospace museums and shows, where the dents and smudged paint from the micrometeorites were still very visible. As interest waned and another controversy of four unmarked cutlasses destroying a whole D sent Drake's reputation back into the negative, the VLT-3 was put back into storage. However, after an Aegis Reclaimer made the most profitable salvage mission in human history in 2932, finding and claiming a failed 22nd century colony ship adrift in deep space, Drake suddenly found renewed interest in a salvage ship. The VLT-3 was taken out of storage, and Sod Perkins began development of what would become the Drake Vulture. The Vulture swapped out the mobile arms for large boom rippers. This new tech allowed for the ship to identify, move, and cut space salvage, then store it in the ship's rear bay, all while not having to EVA. The crew size was reduced to one, with some accommodations built in. Finally, the ship was given an oversized shield generator and more maneuvering thrusters to make it tougher and more nimble around the dangerous debris fields of space. Drake introduced the Vulture in 2938, while the Empire was still in salvage fever. The public demand outstripped the ability of Berea to produce the ship, and famous discoveries made by Vultures, like that of a Genesis Starliner thought to have been destroyed, and two whole A's that had collided and spun off course, just increased the demand for them. While the ship has undergone some improvements over the years, the VLT-3 is still very much alive and well today, with Vultures still in high demand. The next ship we will look at is the Herald. Developed in 2946, this Inforunner has quickly made a name for itself on the market. With its armored computer core, bespoke SATA-M6A1 broadcast array, data storage pods, and EMP protection, it was incredibly affordable. 
With a crew size of one and a blistering fast speed, it was great for independent inforunners, being able to outrun almost anything in a straight line. It has since become the main inforunner for FTL courier services. The next ship is the Drake Buccaneer. Built in 2947 with synergy in mind, the ship was the first dedicated fighter that Drake had ever built. As a result, they wanted to ensure that it would complement the Cutlass and the Caterpillar, excelling at everything the other ships struggled with when it came to combat. They also wanted to ensure it could support the Herald at almost max speed. The result was a flexible, fast, and maneuverable light fighter, capable of performing close fire support and long-range escort roles. Its sole purpose is to work as the missing piece of the Drake combat puzzle, while utilizing similar design and parts as the rest of the Drake family to reduce the cost of maintenance and support. It was around this time that Andon Arden took over, and his impact on the company was fairly dramatic. The first project he greenlit was the Kraken in 2948. While technically a light carrier, the ship was far more of a floating station. Arden heavily leaned into the ship being an Endeavor ship, a force for frontier militias to operate entirely independently. The marketing steered away from the black sheep that was the Cutlass, instead highlighting the Vulture as the new face of Drake. The Kraken is the largest ship that Drake has built to date, with a massive cargo capacity of 3,792 SCU and a length of 270 meters. However, it has a relatively small crew requirement of 1 to 10 to operate, allowing the ship to be crewed by fewer people than the Idris with its minimum crew of 8, with more support for smaller and medium ships of all kinds thanks to its flat top design. It even carries escape pods, being the first Drake ship with such a feature. Andon wasn't done though, announcing the Corsair in 2949. While being heavily upgunned, the ship is not exclusively combat oriented. It instead leaned into the exploration craze that had been kicked off by the release of the first civilian Carrix a few years before, and the announcement of the Pioneer by Consolidated Outland. This ship has incredible luxury for a Drake ship, with private crew cabins for each of the crew, but has the same aesthetic along with parts from other Drake ships in its design. The Corsair has enough cargo room to store a small ship with room to spare, and has enough firepower to deal with any threat imaginable. The ship was designed with long range in mind, and shows just how Drake has changed under the new management, reimagining itself as selling career ships for the people. Along those same lines, the Drake Mule was recently released to complement the cargo hauling needs of the various Drake ships. The tiny cargo mover was designed to fit in most Drake ships, and aided the loading and unloading of larger freight in areas where infrastructure was lacking, while doubling as a delivery truck able to roll right off a ship and drive to deliver goods. The most recent addition to Drake's lineup is probably the quintessential example of this reformed Drake. The Cutter is a small personal transport to rival that of the Mustang and the Aurora, and even takes its inspiration from the VLT instead of the Cutlass, showing how much the Drake Vulture has become the new poster child for Drake's new image. This is a stab at the starter ship market to challenge not only the top dogs on the block, but their eternal rivals Misk and their Reliance series. Origin started life not as a ship manufacturer, but as an engine one. Founded on Earth in Cologne, Germany sometime around 2750, towards the end of the Meser era, they mainly made fusion engines for the UE military and the most ostentatious RSI and Aegis Dynamics star yachts. However, as the need for personal transport ships grew, the company began to make ships of their own. By 2760, they were making a top five selling mid-scale composite transport and by 2810, their luxury ships were competing neck and neck with the companies they used to supply. The company grew exponentially, with their first foray into budget single-seater luxury craft being the 200 and 300 series ships in 2899, of which the 300 series has held the title of the second most used ship in the market ever since. They firmly rooted themselves on Earth, going so far as to proudly proclaim that every part of their 600 series of ships was made on Earth, However, that all changed in 2913, when the current president of the company declared that Terra was the new cultural capital of the UEE and made the then unpopular decision to move to New Austin on Terra, formerly known as the corporate headquarters of Omega Foods. Since then, Origin has taken over the city, with many locals calling it Origin Town, with the city becoming a mecca for spaceship enthusiasts and Origin fans from all over the verse. Now, let's take a look at what's to offer for Origin on the floor. Of IAE. The first ship we're going to look at is the 600i. This was previously a rugged cargo hauler in the mid-29th century, with Origin taking advantage of the cargo crisis. 
It did very well in that role, with many 600 eyes being purchased secondhand to convert into a number of different roles. However, in the 2940s, Origin reevaluated the ship and decided to do a complete overhaul from the ground up. Keeping the interior mostly the same, they entirely gutted the ship, creating what Origin calls the 600i. This has created a somewhat budget touring and exploration ship. The new 600 is a beast of a vessel, with several size 5 weapon hardpoints, two defensive turrets, several shield generators, and plenty of space for both crew and passengers alike. The next ship Origin tackled was the 890 Jump. By 2852, Origin had made a name for itself in luxury personal transport, but they lacked any large yacht, or flagship, of their fleet. So CEO Kane Yolson made a public announcement to build just that. At the time, most high-end large yachts were expensive conversions of haulers or military ships, so Origin was set on building the first truly mass-produced superyacht. There was only one problem, though. There was no such ship in development. Ship manufacturers tend to not announce a ship until they're ready for release, so this was a case of a ship being created from scratch with the eyes of the public bearing down on every detail. The company made an eccentric choice, hiring industrial designer Hadrian Wells instead of a traditional ship designer. Wells demanded the ship look as much at home on the sea as in space, which caused the ship to look very different from the traditional designs of the time. This process being very public meant that the press and competitors were ruthless, claiming the ship was never coming out or had failed in secret. To everyone's astonishment, the ship took 18 months from its design to complete the prototype, and in a flashy public exhibition in Earth's orbit in March of 2857, the 890 Jump was revealed to the press. The press did a complete 180 and began hailing the ship as the future of spaceflight. Today, the ship remains mostly the same, though it underwent a retrofit in 2944 and includes a custom snubcraft in the form of the 85X. The next ship is probably the most iconic ship of the Origin line, the 300 series. The 300 is the result of the X-3 program, which was meant to be the first foray into personal spaceships by Origin, who had suffered several setbacks with the 100 series not living up to their expectations. So when they felt they had nailed their goals, they showed the experimental ship off in 2889 at the Terra Air and Space Show. It immediately sent shockwaves through the aerospace industry. Until then, Origin had stuck to larger yachts and personal transports. Here was a true personal spacecraft with the flair and design that Origin had been known for. The X-3 would then be greenlit as its own dedicated line known as the 300. The team was headed by design Wunderkind Andres Lang. The motto he drilled into the team was, Many creatures create tools, but humanity is defined by a more sacred ability to appreciate beauty, and to use that to appreciate and create art. The team was stacked with true believers like Andres, who didn't just want to make a ship, but a statement. The eclectic mix of spacecraft engineers, artists, and craftspeople created a ship that looked as good as it flew. The first test flights took off from the Frankfurt Cosmodrome in 2897, which showed the ship performing as expected, but the true reason for the success of the ship came a year later in 2898. It was then that the High Court passed down a verdict in Pressman versus the United Empire of Earth that allowed civilian craft to use the same speed safety standards that racing ships had been using for years. Thus, when the ship was released in 2899, it was the first ship capable of exceeding the previous speed limits, making it truly the fastest civilian ship on the market. The first variant of the 300 to release was the 350R in 2903 with a limited production run explicitly for the racing circuit, where it dominated for decades. The next model was the Pocket Explorer in 2930, the 315P, which proved popular with smaller prospector crews who used it to find resources more efficiently and comfortably. The last version, the Combat Focus 325A, had some mystery surrounding it, as the ship itself was obviously designed to UEE Navy specifications. Rumors swirled around the ship as the design indicated that it had been developed 10 years before the release in 2940, indicating that it might have been commissioned by the UEE, but with no understanding as to why. The next products of origin we're going to look at were the ships specifically designed to replace the 350R, the M50, and the 85X. In 2915, reorganization and optimization of production of 300Is and their variants led to an entire factory being freed up. 
Origins decided to use the extra space to build a ship to win the next Murray Cup. Two teams were formed to design and build their own versions of that ship. The Model XVB team was headed by the 300 Series veteran designer Tam Newsom, while the Y Series Interceptor was led by the up-and-coming designer Alberto Vara. The ships were rigorously tested by the Origin Racing Team. Both were better than the 350R by a significant margin, but it was the Y Series team that won out thanks to the ship's modularity and upgrade capacity. The Y Series then became known as the Origin M50 and would be revealed at IAE 2917 set to release the next year. However, safety issues kept the ship from being sold until 2920. Then it would be three more years before the ship was able to compete professionally. But when it made its debut in 2923, it blew away their competition, winning the Murray Cup. The M50 was even in use by the military and advocacy, who purchased 144 M50s to act as interceptors in 2937, which became the core of the advocacy's elite interdiction force known as Bronson's Bolts, who were deployed to areas of high crime. While the XVB lost the competition, it would be revived in 2943 as the custom snubcraft for the brand new 890 Jump known as the 85X. One of the most recent ships of the fleet is the 100i. The original 100 series was a disappointing failure, an experiment that taught the teams at Origin the lessons they needed to learn about how to make personal spacecraft, and would lead to the development of the 200 and 300. In the 2940s, the team at Origin developed a fuel scoop and processor they called the Air System. With this smaller, more efficient refueling system, they decided to revive the older experiment of the 100, and in 2950, they released the new 100i as a beginner ship, with the air system on board each variant to give it extended range over its competition. The ship comes in three different variants, the base 100i, the extended cargo bay of the 135C, and the souped-up combat variant of the 125A. The latest release from Origin is the 400i. Designed to capitalize on the exploration craze of the post-civilian Carrick era, the ship was specifically designed not to be luxury, with more of a home-away-from-home -home approach. Taking cues from the 890, the ship was designed with a large skinny front and has a crew of 1-3. to three. Famously, the ship is built with a dedicated bay for another Alberto Farah designed race ship, the X-1. The X-1 was built from lightweight polymers and takes speed and agility to the next level thanks to seamlessly integrated engine technology. It's designed as a snub open-top canopy racer. The last vehicle on display is the G-12. This closed canopy rover is designed to allow for longer exploration in hostile environments without requiring the driver and passengers to wear suits. It even has an official UEE military variation known as the G-12A, which comes with missiles and armor designed for VIP transport. Founded in 2532 in Jata on Cestulus in the Davian system, Aegis Dynamics predates the UEE by several years. It was founded by a merger of Aegis Macrocomputing, a spacecraft computer manufacturer, and Dynamic Production Facilities, a spacecraft and component production company, for the explicit purpose of making military ships. Two years before, humanity had a rude awakening, after the first contact with the Xi'an showed just how weak we were militarily compared to our galactic neighbors, and had sent the then-UPE military into a panic. Nothing humanity had could even come close to the military might of what we knew the Xi'an possessed. As a result, a top-to-bottom refit of the Navy was underway, which these two companies wanted to take advantage of. Before they could build their first ship, however, humanity entered their first interstellar war, but not with the Xi'an. Another species who was contacted in 2541, the Devaran, who attacked the UPE in hopes of expanding their empire. During the war, Aegis rapidly developed their first ship, the Retaliator Bomber, by talking with veterans and asking them what they wanted in a bomber. The result was a ship tailor-made to the needs of the warfighters of humanity, and proved to be a devastating tool in the First Devaran War. In fact, it saved the life of the future leader of humanity, Ivar Mezer, who would reward Aegis for their ship with immense fortune. Ivar Mezer emerged from the war as the great hero of humanity, and managed to wrestle control of the government using his fame and reputation to form the United Empire of Earth. Aegis would reap the rewards of this change of government, as Mezer and his descendants heavily relied on the manufacturer to supply their growing military and police forces with weapons, to keep the population under control, and to win a feared future war with the Xi'an. That all would come crashing down in 2792, when the last Mezer was overthrown in a popular revolution. That left Aegis in a bad political position. They were spared the purges of companies that had ties with the Mezers 
only because so much of the military was composed of Aegis ships and components that it would be impossible to dissolve the company and keep the peace in the new UEE. However, they did lose all their military contracts, which brought this once powerful manufacturer to its knees. Something would arise to save the company in an unexpected place. By the 29th century, the company learned that many of their ships, which had become military surplus, were popular with ship customizers and frontier militia. So the company pivoted to the private sector, selling older versions of their iconic ships to the masses, who scrambled to get their hands on the tried and tested equipment. Over time, Aegis won back favor with the UEE, though even today, their main source of revenue is no longer the government, but the general public, who have come to rely on their battle-tested ships for their daily lives. Now, let's look at what's on offer from Aegis on the floor today. The oldest ship in the fleet is the Retaliator. Built in 2544, this torpedo bomber set the tone for how Aegis develops their ships, by talking to people who will be using them to find out what they need from it. The Retaliator is over 400 years old, so old that the original Retaliators didn't even have shields. However, it is still in use with the UE military today. It has been maintained and upgraded over the years, with the addition of better engines, reworked interior, and, of course, shields. Historically, the ship is rife with controversy. The ship became the face of the Meza regime, plastered all over recruitment posters. It was also their go-to terror weapon against the populace. Most infamously, the ship was responsible for using cluster bombs against a civilian activist group during the Meza era. However, the most famous retaliator squadron, Squadron 78, have been proclaimed as heroes after refusing to bomb another civilian installation at the end of the Meser era, the revolution toppling the Mezers, sparing the brave crews from their inevitable execution. The prevalence of civilian modified and customized retaliators also led to Aegis pivoting towards the civilian market. Today, they even have modules for the bomber to turn the ship into a home away from home, a cargo ship, and even a drop ship. The next oldest ship from Aegis is the Nautilus. Built in 2549, in the aftermath of the First of Aran War, this mine layer was developed, like most Aegis ships, using feedback from the mine laying crews of the Tavaran War. The result was a bespoke covert ship able to deploy area denial weapons with precision over volume. The ship has seen extensive service and upgrades over 400 years, from the accidental elimination of the Big Hat pirate crew to helping shape the battle at Centauri during the Second Tavaran War, leading to the ultimate victory of the UAE over the resurgent Tavaran fleet, and the Hellkite run to utterly destroy the fleeing Vanduul during the Battle of Oberon. After 400 years of service, the ship was declassified and made available to the public alongside a new role of Mine Retriever with the development of the Nemo drone, which was designed to recover and defuse even the oldest mines. This next ship is one of the most renowned human fighters ever made, the Gladius. Made in 2579, it was the replacement for the famous stiletto light fighter used during the First of Iron War. While light fighters were originally designed to intercept bombers, the stiletto was mostly relegated to escort duty during the war. However, during the fall of the UES Olympus, the ship's stiletto combat air patrol fended off waves of pirates for an incredible amount of time. When the black boxes of these fighters made it back to the UEE, the resulting propaganda of the last stand of the Olympus cap resulted in the next generation of light fighters to be greenlit, the Aegis Gladius. Using captured Tavarin technology, the Gladius was the first human-designed small fighter with a shield and was renowned for being agile, fast, and deadly in a dogfight. The ship was widely utilized by the UEE and was very effective as a light fighter and is still in use today, though being phased out as its main weakness, heavy fighters, are the primary ships of the Van Duel. However, that didn't stop one plucky Gladius pilot, Condi Hillard, from being the first human pilot to shoot down a Van Duel scythe. She was part of a private military company called Orion Defense Protection and was deployed in 2677 to try and stop some of the first Van Duel raids in the Orion system. On the way back from a patrol, she and her flight encountered scythes on their way to attack the ODP's operation base. She got the jump on the attackers and managed to shoot down one of them, causing the rest to scatter. In her honor, Aegis released the Gladius Valiant with her custom livery and loadout. The next ship was built in 2594 and was the first custom fleet support ship of the UEE, the Vulcan. Designed by the famed designer Parnell Rowan to help keep small fighter squadrons equipped, fueled, and repaired on the go, the Vulcan found another purpose very early on. Early UEE was still very wild, with not enough infrastructure in most systems to support large traffic passing through. This limited who could own personal spacecraft dramatically, with the United Wayfarers Club stepping in to try and fix the issue with modified haulers. When the UWC found out of the development of the Vulcan, they reached out to Aegis asking to purchase their own fleet. 
This had never happened before, so they had to ask the UEE, who gave Aegis their blessing, as it would reduce the pressure on them to build more infrastructure. Thus, the Vulcan became the first civilian version of an Aegis ship, and also one of the standard sites when it comes to rescue and repair operations in the verse. The secret of the ship is the barred drones, which can be configured to repair, refuel, or rearm ships, without either the ships or the drones having to stop. This means the Vulcan can stay a safe distance away from the targets it's servicing, allowing for frontline repair, refuel, and rearmament. Next on the list is the A3G Vanguard. It's the standard UEE heavy fighter, first produced in 2737. It was built with a Vanduul in mind, being upgunned and heavily armored to be able to take a beating while having impressive flight range. Its secret lies in its modular design, with a central bay that can be swapped out for the ship to pivot rolls. The standard version is known as the Warden, and is mainly a long-range heavy fighter. There's also an electronic warfare module known as the Sentinel, which offers a suite of e-warfare options. Then there is the Harbinger, the fighter-bomber variant which allows for a ship to carry size 5 torpedoes. The final version is known as the Hoplite, which turns the Vanguard into a troop transport capable of carrying up to six Marines in full kit. The Avenger was first built as a two-seater medium carrier fighter in 2760. While it was impressive for its time, it was quickly replaced after the fall of the Mezzers by the superior Hornet. However, the advocacy saw the value in these ships and made them their main operations craft for their agents, even today. The key to the post-military success of the ship is its flexibility. Modern Avengers have swapped out this second seat for a small living quarters to allow advocacy agents to remain longer in the field. Aegis also modified the standard ship to create several variants, all of which have seen extensive use by the advocacy. The Stalker variant is the mainline ship used by these agents. With six cryoprison pods in its back, the agents can apprehend suspects and keep them safe, even if they continue searching for more suspected criminals. The Titan swaps out prison cells for more cargo, though the most famous Titan was operated by Agent Danny Solomon of the Bremen system, who used the Titan to drop the weight in order to capture smugglers. However, criminals thought that it was because the agent didn't take anyone alive, which Agent Solomon would lean into by naming his Avenger the Renegade. The last variant is known as the Warlock and swaps out the back for a custom EMP generator to disable ships before they can run. The same versatility that attracted the advocacy has attracted the public as well, with the Stalker and Warlock being primary ships for many bounty hunters in the verse today, and the Titan being many a pilot's first cargo ship. The Hammerhead was first built in 2773 as part of Project Monitor to replace the aging Gawain-class patrol ship. From the inception, the Hammerhead was seen as an anti-fighter and torpedo screen vessel. With the fall of the Mezzers in 2792, the Hammerhead was left in an awkward position. No new contracts from the UE Navy were issued, but they were expected to maintain and upgrade any ships the UE still owned. However, the UEE never signed an exclusive contract with the Hammerhead, which allowed Aegis to sell them to the private sector. Four more additional versions of the Hammerhead were introduced between 2773 and today. Each fixed or upgraded older issues like the sensors, control surfaces, and additional turrets. The Flight 5s have undergone early jump tunnel development, but there's currently no contract in place to build a version 5. Built in 2930, the Eclipse is an odd ship. Its main purpose was to be a stealth bomber capable of attacking the Xi'an. This is strange as it was over a hundred years after the thawing of relations between the two empires. Tested and operated in secret, the ship has performed multiple clandestine raids, which remain secret to this day. After being revealed in 2947, the ship has been made available to militias and the public at large. Next one is one of the newest ships from Aegis, the Sabre. Built as part of the Next Generation Fighter contest held by the UEE, the ship is likely an updated design of an older test ship known as the Comet. This ship was extensively tested by the legendary pilot Camor Dalyan, who ensured that the Comet was one of the best fighters in the post-Avaran war period, and helped pave the way for all modern Aegis designs. There is still some confusion as we do not know the outcome of the Next Generation Fighter contest, but another contest named the same, with the same goals, was in lore 15 years before. So, it's likely that the Sabre was built for that contest under the name the Dogfighter 3000, where it lost to the Anvil F8 Lightning. Still, the ship has made its way into the ranks of the UE Navy, and thanks to Aegis's new policy of selling to the public at large, they didn't even wait for the announcement of the winner of the contest before selling the ship to militias who requested them. The last two ships have no official release time, but were still available on the floor. 
the first being the Aegis Reclaimer. The Reclaimer is a massive salvage ship capable of salvaging large wrecks with ease. It's equipped with serious firepower for protection and is often crewed by large crews who help process the scrap gathered to sell it to the market. The last ship on this list is the gunship known as the Redeemer. Designed with ground support in mind, this ship boasts massive size 5 turrets with seats for extra passengers and even more weapons to support any operation from the sky. Its experimental vector lock engine design gives it a significant flexibility to hover and loiter. Now, no one manufacturer exists of ships in the Banu Protectorate. The ships that humans are able to purchase in the UEE is part of a collective agreement between various independent manufacturers of the same ships, known as Suli. Suli are part family and part trade guild, and are the main unit of Banu society. Because the Banu don't have a same concept of intellectual property as humanity does, they see no issue in anyone who can make something to be able to make it. As they regard skill above all else, in their mind it isn't about who owns what, but who can make it the best. The agreement between these collective shipbuilding Sulis and the UEE is to keep a standard version for human use. So the Banu ships we get in the UEE are export ones designed exclusively for the human market. With that said, let's look at what the Banu have to offer on the floor. The Banu Defender is a dual seat fighter. Because the Banu don't keep records, we don't know just how old it is, but we do know that it's the first alien ship humanity ever encountered, with a Banu pilot that came to be known as Jerry. The ship itself is a hodgepodge of different species components, with Gion thrusters, Tavarn shields, Banu weapons, and much more. The main draw of this ship is maneuverability, designed more to bait attackers away from valuable transports than tackle them head on and destroy them. The next manufacturer is actually two, both Xi'an. The way commerce works in the Xi'an Empire is again very alien compared to how we think it should work. The Emperor chooses which family house should be responsible for what products, with minor houses being sworn to the larger houses who use their resources to make the products. As a result, Aopoa and Gatak are actually Xi'an noble families, as well as companies. Aopoa is responsible for light manufacturing, and is known for being politically aggressive, having challenged the former house who built light craft to a competition, where they incorporated the imperial family iconography into their ship, which the other families were unwilling to damage, and displeased the emperor, gaining Aopoa the right to make light craft. They're probably most known for their dealings with Misk. The two parties have traded technologies and plans between one another, with Misk getting Xi'an Tech and Aopoa getting plans for the whole series of ships. While Aopoa wouldn't manufacture these ships, it's not hard to believe that they gifted these plans to Gatak as a means to leverage a favor from them in the future. Gatak is responsible for all industrial ships built in the Xi'an Empire. The house had close ties to the first emperor of the Xi'an, who granted the house permanent, irrevocable right of being the main manufacturer of industrial ships. Gatak is also dedicated to the study of alien engineering, and thus are frequently at any and all shipmaking conferences to learn more about the non Xi'an way of ship design. This is why they are so fascinated by the whole series of ships by Misk. Let's look at what these houses have brought to the floor this year. First is the Aopoa Kartu All, or Xi'an Scout. Its name literally means Direfly, the export model, as it is the export and human modified version of a military light fighter. In fact, a capture version of the military model of this ship was the inspiration behind what would eventually become the Intergalactic Aerospace Expo. This ship was maneuverable, fast, and can pack a punch with its twin size 4 weapon mounts. Since 2910, the Kartu All has been exported to the human market, making it the first Xi'an ship exported to humans. The next ship is actually an open topped racer, the Nox. This ship was inspired by human hover snubs like the Dragonfly. Xi'an and humans share a world of Oya 3, where they constantly interact and exchange culture with one another. One such cultural exchange was allowing Xi'an to ride the brand new Drake Dragonflies that the humans had acquired in the late 29th century. Word of how thrilling the experience was reached back to the Imperial household, who gave permission to Aopoa to design their own version, which would become known as the Nox. The last Aopoa ship is the Santokyai, which translates to, literally, the ship that creates genuine fear. This is actually named for a flying creature called the Tokyai, which translates as the animal that creates genuine fear. So the San Tokyai is similar to how humans naming a ship for Hawk or Falcon. 
This medium fighter is a new ship in the Xi'an fleet, as it has been observed by UEE patrols as late as 2915. Designated as the Ares by the UEE, the first up-close look humanity got was in 2941, when four were forced to crash land on an icy moon due to an oxygen failure. The UEE destroyer Eagle's Talon, possibly a javelin, was dispatched to the site before the Xi'an could arrive, and sent Argo MPUVs with rescue teams to attempt to save the pilots. One group discovered one pilot alive but crushed under the wreckage. But as the crew attempted to de-ice the wreckage to retrieve the injured Xi'an, an explosion occurred, killing the crew and the pilot. Luckily, rescue crews were able to find another pilot alive and rescue them to bring them back to their people. While tragic, this was seen as a net positive for relations between the two species and empires, and is likely why Aopoa began the export version of the ship in 2948. The sole GATAC entry in this year's IAE is the Raylan. This medium freighter was designed explicitly for both the human and Xi'an markets at the same time in 2951. It was built with the needs of human and Xi'an crew in mind, and will likely be the exact same ship sold to both species, with little to no modification. It features an armored hull, tractor beams, two-man turrets, and can hold up to 320 SCUs of cargo. Founded on Terra in 2873 by brothers Javi and Theo Ingstrom, Asperia was originally supposed to be a repository for lost ship blueprints. The brothers were fascinated with rare lost ships, many of which were designed but never saw production, and were heartbroken when they realized only a fraction of these ships survived down the ages. So, they wanted their company to store and maintain these blueprints in the hopes that future engineers might be inspired by the mistakes of the past. When their business took off, they decided to take some of the funds from the sales of these blueprints to try and make their own versions of these lost ships. Since then, the company has expanded to build custom ships for private collectors, military training, and the public at large. They have dedicated departments designed to study and recreate lost alien technologies, which are the main offerings we see on the floor today. The first is a Vanduul Blade. This light fighter was commissioned by the military initially for UEE pilots to train against, as it was a one-to-one -one recreation of the infamous Vanduul ship. Most of these ships were eventually returned to Asperia, as the blade became less frequent on the battlefield and the military contracts with Asperia had expired. However, since the Battle of Uriel, Asperia has made the controversial decision to begin retrofitting these old blades to be used by frontier militia and selling them to the general public. The next ship is another Vanduul replica, the Glaive. This reproduction was actually the result of a contest done for the original system's video game, Arena Commander. The Navy requested the Glaive's addition to the popular Vanduul Swarm mode as a means to educate the public on the dangers of the ship. The Navy had also commissioned several Glaives from Asperia to help train UE pilots years before, so Asperia partnered with Original Systems for some of these replicas of the Glaive to be available to purchase. The next Asperia ships are the Tavarin series of ships. In 2941, when the system of Cabal was first surveyed and discovered to have an ancient abandoned Tavarin colony on it, Asperia was given access to study the abandoned ships and wrecks that remained in the old Tavarin defense hangars. These ships were studied by human and Tavarin engineers, archaeologists, scientists, and historians before being sent back to make more invasive studies on some of the surviving ships. The result was Asperia faithfully recreating both the Talon and Prowler while updating them for use in modern day. The Prowler is a recreation of the infamous stealth boarding dropship of the same name, which was used by the Tavarin in the First and Second Tavarin Wars. These ships were crewed by the infamous Naule warriors, who could covertly board UEE capital ships and kill the entire crew before the alarm could be raised. The Talon is the infamous light fighter used by the Tavarin during both wars. They were famous for their hit-and-run attacks on shipping and ground targets and were said to have a distinctive whine in atmosphere when they dived to strafe human targets. They also built a later version of the Talon known as the Shrike, which was built for the Second Tavarin War, which swapped out the guns for missiles to try and overload the shields that human ships were then equipped with. Anvil Aerospace started life as Case Aerospace in 2623, Leonard Case was an RSI engineer who had developed the direct descendant of the modern Aurora, but got fed up with the bureaucratic red tape of Robert Space Industries and left to start his own company. There he made the Cosmo Sloop, a yacht designed to be simple to fly. Unfortunately, the sales didn't do well because it was released in 2604, just a year before the outbreak of the Second Tavarin War. However, the war brought new opportunities to Case, as the Navy needed something to counter the new phalanx shields of the Tavarin fleet. 
Working with his team, Case developed the Hurricane, a design to imitate the defensive Jackal Tavarn fighters, but with an offensive turret. The design proved effective and got the interest of the Messers, who gave the new up-and-coming manufacturer a contract to replace the aging Perseus as a long-range patrol craft to counter the Chian. Unfortunately, Case was killed in an in-atmosphere collision, and the Navy lost interest without his participation. The Hurricane was slowly phased out, and Case Aerospace would be bought out by an investment group in 2623. But it wasn't the end of the legacy of Case. J. Harris Arnold became obsessed with Leonard Case, who was mostly forgotten by the mid-20th century. Arnold loved everything about his design, including the curved wings and open circle signet. So he created his own company in 2772 in Nova Kiev on Terra, Anvil Aerospace. He took heavy inspiration from Case's style. The name of the company is in reference to Robert Calvin's famous quote, justifying UEE expansionism, that military spending fuels the furnaces of expansion and strikes the anvils of innovation. While struggling to break into the military market early on, with the fall of the Mezzers and Aegis's fall from grace, Anvil managed to get their shot when they were tapped to design the rugged forward scout, which would become known as the Terrapin in 2796. This led them to being picked to replace the Avenger in 2806 with their iconic F7A Hornet. It was then that Anvil cemented the future of military spacecraft, not just with their designs, but with their dual civilian and military lines. As civilian pilots were clambering for better combat ships in the uncertain times of the post messer era, many had requested civilian versions of the Hornet before the ship had even made it to the ranks of the Navy. Anvil requested permission from the UEE, who gave them their blessing. Thus, the F-7C was created, birthing a tradition that continues to this day in Anvil Aerospace. Anvil has been slowly replacing Aegis as the main military manufacturer of the UEE ever since, and have helped establish Terra as a main hub of future spacecraft development. However, as they began to rise in prominence, the similarities between Anvil and Case ships drew the attention of the company that owned the rights to Case ships, who sued Anvil for infringement. However, by then, Anvil was a darling of the industry, so as a counteroffer, Arnold just bought the rights for the inflated price, in order to be the true owner of Case's legacy. Now let's look at what Anvil has to offer on the floor of IAE today. The U-4 Terrapin is an armored scout ship used by the UE Navy. Built as part of the restructuring of the post messer Navy, this ship was designed to be used for Overwatch, Long Endurance Picket, and to boost recon capabilities of the fleet. Its main deployment was in two border systems, which the Navy didn't have the resources to send a capital ship to monitor, and it performed its job admirably. With a max crew of two, oversized scanning array, and armor so thick it overheated the ship without the addition of a cooling vents, the ship was well suited for its role. Because of its ease of maintenance, reliability, and reputation for surviving incredible amounts of damage, it was loved by its crews, so much so that it was often purchased surplus by veterans when they got out of the service. This may have been the impetus for Anvil to begin selling all their military ships to both civilian and military markets at the same time. The next ship from Anvil is the best space fighter in human history, the F-7 Hornet. Built to replace the Aegis Avenger, this medium fighter has a reputation for excellence. Since its introduction in 2806, the ship has logged more combat time and kills in more theaters than any other ship in the history of space combat. It was built to deal with the Xi'an and Van Duel simultaneously, and was incredibly effective at countering both, while showing great results against pirates. It was also built for the civilian market and military market at the same time, and has proved popular for both for almost 150 years. Arya Riley, the famed ace of celebrated Squadron 42, was so enamored by the Hornet that she famously said, Give me a fully loaded Hornet, and I will shake the gates of heaven. She meticulously tested every ship she was ever assigned during her early career, and all of them failed her tests until she found the Hornet. Not only was it the best ship for her needs, but she found it almost impossible to beat for its flexibility. She famously said, There wasn't a scenario or loadout that I could put the Hornet through that it couldn't find its way out of. It was like the damn ship was doomed to succeed. In honor of her service, Anvil released a special version of the F-7C called the Wildfire, with Arya Riley's all-purpose loadout. In 2923, the F-7C Hornet, the civilian variant, got an overhaul to update it with more modern technologies. This process was so successful that the F-7A, the military version, also underwent a refit to bring it up to modern UEE standards in 2946. This was teamed with the F-7C getting specialized versions for the civilian market that same year. 
those of which include the F7CS Ghost, which is a stealth paint applied to its hull to create a stealth variant, the F7CT Tracker, which has a Willis Op Long Look radar equipped to turn it into a scanning ship, and the F7CM Super Hornet, which is a two-seat version, which is as close to the military spec Hornet as the UEE would allow. The Valkyrie has a bit of a strange pass, as it was actually developed before the UEE even requested it. In 2802, as Anvil was deep into the development of the Hornet, Anvil wanted to make a non-combat ship for the military, but had no idea what to make. So they fed the data on future needs of the military into an analytical supercomputer at the Levendosk Institute on Terra. What they got back was the prediction that the UEE would need a heavy troop dropship to retake systems from the Van Duel. Thus, the Valkyrie began development. So in 2810, when the UEE requested a heavy troop dropship, not only did Anvil apply, but had the prototype already ready to go. Needless to say, it was accepted and has become the prime dropship of the UEE Army and Navy ever since. The civilian versions of the ship are often used by surveyors and prospectors who find the ability to transport large numbers of personnel and light vehicles quickly and safely to multiple sites to be an effective tool. The next vehicle from Anvil is actually three. The Atlas chassis was developed sometime before 2822 as part of the retooling of the military in the post measure era. The UAE needed a flexible platform for multiple roles, and their go-to manufacturer of ground vehicles, Tumbro Land Systems, was in the middle of its slow decline. So the UEE turned to Anvil to help. Today, the Atlas has three known variants that have made it to civilian life. The anti-air missile platform known as the Ballista, the anti-air gun platform known as the Centurion, and the armored personnel carrier known as the Spartan. The same year the Atlas was released, another famed Anvil ship made its debut, the Carrick. Developed out of a classified disaster of the loss of a capital ship while it was performing a science mission, the Carrick was a top-secret ship at its inception. It is the first dedicated exploration and survey ship built for the military, and they hold many endurance records, including being the only ship to study the outer Oort cloud of the 194 AU Killian system. Famously, the classified disaster coupled with very secret tech installed on the Carrick prevented the ship from being developed for the civilian market alongside its military cousin. It took almost a hundred years for the civilian version to be released, and in doing so, caused a wave of enthusiasm for exploration. The darling of this week's show is also connected to the Carrick, as part of the program for developing the ship was a bespoke snub craft known as the C-8 Pisces. This year, Anvil released a variant of the snub to work as a rescue ambulance equipped with a Tier 3 auto dock medical bed. This is sure to excite more interest in search and rescue in the near future. Next on this list is both the oldest ship of Anvil, but at the same time not, the A-4 Hurricane. The Hurricane was first developed by Case Aerospace for the Second Varn War. However, it was phased out of UEE service after the death of Case himself. During the return of the Van Duel threat in the late 29th century, Anvil re-released the updated Hurricane in 2871, too much fanfare and success. During the fall of Calvan, it proved very effective clearing out Van Duel fighter wings, clearing paths for civilian evacuation. This achievement has cemented its place in the Navy and Marine fleets. The key to this ship's success is its firepower. It is a two-seater heavy fighter with a gunner controlling a massive quad size 3 turret, which has almost 360 degree view of the battlefield, allowing for devastating alpha strike capabilities combined with zoom and boom tactics. It has become a favorite of both military and militia alike. The T-8 Gladiator Bomber has a colorful history to say the least. Developed in 2890, this ship was publicly stated to be the first in a new naval doctrine of carrier-based torpedo bombers. But in reality, it was a more shameful history. Starting life as the T-3 Gladiator, the ship was designed to carry a revolutionary, self-guided, stealth, shield-skipping torpedo known as the Multi-Vector Torpedo. The MVT needed a ship close enough to the target to keep the final destination targeted for it to follow so the Gladiator was designed to do just that. The only issue was that the MVT was a scam. Nothing but a torpedo with some off-the-shelf parts stuck to it. Rather than admit that they were had, the Navy retold the Gladiator to make the T-8 and hailed it as a carrier bomber that could protect itself with its gunner seat. This proved disastrous, and it was made worse by the Gladiator squadrons being used as dumping grounds for pilots with poor performance and attitudes. It took a rework of naval doctrine to accommodate the ship, 
and proper training for its crews before the ship began to show its worth, especially in the hands of the famed Black Crows of Squadron 214. This bomber is highly modular, with its torpedo bay being able to be swapped out for smaller missiles, a command and control module, environmental manipulation, supply pod, and even a medical search and rescue bay. The ship is armed with even more missiles on the wings, and two pilot-controlled and two gunner-controlled size 3 mounts. The F-8 Lightning was built as a replacement for the aging Hornet in 2933, likely beating out the Scorpius and Sabre for the next generation fighter contest. This ship is a culmination of everything Anvil learned about fighting the Vanduul and is slowly replacing the old Aegis fighters like the Gladius and the older Anvil Hornets to become the main fighter of the UEE. The most famous of these ships belong to the Reckless 999th Test Squadron, who often perform air shows with their custom livery F-8s. The key to this heavy fighter's success is in its armor and sheer volume of fire. With six size 3 and two size 4 weapon mounts, along with two size 3 missile mounts, this ship can decimate any fighter in its class. With its hardened armor, the ship can withstand withering amounts of fire and still punch back. While the military versions of the ship are slowly rolling out, a civilian variant is also in the works and is set to arrive soon. The next ship is the U-9 Hawk, the result of Project Brawler in 2937. The Anvil Hawk is a bit of an awkward ship, designed to do a number of missions with very little overlap between them. The ship's main roles are close-range dogfighting, logistics support, and ground attack missions, all of which it does well though that's all it really does well. The key to its adoption was its usage of several standard Hornet parts to make maintenance and supply chains easier to manage. The Hawk has struggled to find its place in the UE Navy, as wherever it's deployed, it does its job so well that the criminals it's deployed against just stay off planets for fear of being attacked and stay far away from the ship in a dogfight. However, the civilian market has absolutely devoured the ship, with its unique mission profile making it perfect for bounty hunters. The ship has two size 1 and four size 2 weapon mounts, with a small EMP and containment pod for prisoner transport. Civilian users have even been modifying their Hawks since the civilian debut. The two most popular modifications are the upgun Dire Hawk and the stealth Shadow Hawk. The former is said to be in the works to be adopted as an official variant. One of the latest ships from Anvil is the Nimble and Deadly Arrow. With the retirement of the Gladius ongoing, many manufacturers have stepped up to try to be the next great light fighter for the UEE. Anvil's entry is the Arrow, which was released in 2948. This is a nimble and deadly ship which trades Anvil's signature heavy armor for speed and maneuverability. It still has the characteristic heavy guns of Anvil with two size 1 and two size 3 hardpoints. The last three ships are not available on the verse, but will be soon. The Legionnaire is a breacher ship designed to dock with other ships with a cargo full of eight angry marines and their gear, who then breach the doors to storm the ship. The ship also comes with a dedicated hacking device for overriding locks of ships, if possible, for some light electronic warfare capabilities. The Liberator is Anvil's light transport designed to move small numbers of ships and vehicles to the front lines. Part carrier, part landing craft, this ship has three small pads on top and a garage capable of holding two vehicles like the Atlas or snub ships like the Pisces, with additional storage as well. The Crucible is a flying garage capable of repairing and refitting small ships on the go. This flying toolbox, as it has been affectionately dubbed, is perfect for any mobile repairs. It has an enclosed and detachable repair bay called the Anvil Scarab and has remote repair arms and a crew of up to eight. Founded in 2243 by Alana Redmond, the company started life working on trains. Redmond was an engineer who worked on the Trans-American Maglev train route. This system was getting old, and when she saw a bit of scrap metal melted to the rail during a maintenance stop, she had an idea to build a system that repaired the track as the train ran. This system became an instant seller and Argo took off, eventually becoming the premier train engine, track, and systems manufacturer on Earth. Argo expanded to do rail networks in other worlds, starting with Mars, but eventually discovered that the true delays in their networks had nothing to do with trains, but with the ships that were to load and unload with the trains. So they developed the Orbital Utility Craft, which worked as a small freight shuttle. This became so popular that the company pivoted away from trains to spaceships, building more ships dedicated to improving infrastructure. Let's see what Argo has to offer for us on the floor today. The first, oldest, and most dear to my heart 
is the Multipurpose Utility Vehicle, or MPUV. This was developed from the OUC sometime before 2665 to replace the aging design and help future-proof it. The key to the success of the MPUV is its modularity. The ship can take a number of different pods to use as its main fuselage. These include cargo, personnel, repair, and even a search and rescue module. This has allowed the ship to pivot with modern updates over the years by simply improving or introducing new models. The ship is standard issue on every capital ship in the UE fleet, common at most space stations, and often one of the first ships a new pilot will learn to fly. Because it's cheap and simple to operate, it is a very common sight in the UEE. The next Argo design is a more modern one, the Mole. This multi-crew miner was first built in 2849 and revealed at IAE that year. It's a large ship with a crew of up to four with three separate mining heads, mineral pods for storage, crew quarters, and upgraded mining hardware to crack tougher rocks. Its unique feature was that the side mining arms actually are exposed to the vacuum of space. This allows the system to be simpler to operate and to fix, though increasing the operations cost and risk. The Raft is the next ship on the floor. Built in 2951, this ship is designed explicitly for shorter cargo hauls in locations with limited infrastructure. The universe of the 30th century has little to no up-to-date infrastructure outside of the core systems. Many stations are coming up on several centuries of upkeep and maintenance, and frontier worlds are often just lucky to have a pad able to support more than an aurora, let alone the dockyards to load and unload ships. The Raft was designed explicitly to deal with this issue by bringing the crane with the ship, drastically speeding up loading times and thus profits. The last ship is still in development, but will soon reach the verse, the SRV. This is a space tow truck with a crew of one and a massive tractor beam rig. It can haul medium ships through quantum and help salvage and repair them, and also help carry large crates from ground to orbit and vice versa, all while being protected by thick armor. The next manufacturer is Consolidated Outland. Founded in Stalford on Rytif in the Bremen system by quote-unquote rebel trillionaire Silas Kerner, this manufacturer has set its sights on unseating RSI as the premier spacecraft manufacturer of the 30th century. Kerner was born a billionaire with his family from old money on the planet, being one of the founding families of Stalford. He has always been a spaceship enthusiast and vocal about his disdain for modern space designs. So, after managing to invest half his wealth into a communications company that took off, and investing into Earth Seafood, which also took off, he has trillions to his name with nothing to do. Thus, he turned his wealth into his passion. Initially, Consolidated Outland simply built third-party conversion kits, including its most popular one, which converted the appearance of the F7C Hornet into an F7A Hornet. This became the big break for the company. Afterwards, they began to work on their first true ship, the Mustang, which launched the company into the position they are now, the main up-and-coming manufacturer of the Verse. Let's see what the boy from Bremen has to offer on the floor today. First off is the classic Mustang series. Boldly claiming that the ship was so advanced it would set the benchmark for innovations and excellence, the ship series has made a splash when it was first introduced in 2944. It was designed to unseat the venerable Aurora, with the ad campaign by CNOU depicting the classic RSI starter as boring and outdated, which seemed to work. While there was an experimental twin Mustang design, the testing resulted in some catastrophic failure and was eventually scrapped discussed later by Kerner as a very bad idea from the start. Every Mustang is equipped similarly with at least two size one and two size two weapon mounts and all size one components. The main Mustang most people are familiar with is the Alpha. Coming standard with a small four SCU cargo hold, this ship is the most versatile of the line, able to do double duty as a combat ship and freight hauler. The next is the Beta. This exploration variant has personal habitation section and a slightly extended range to keep its pilots out in the black for longer. The Delta is the militia variant of the ship, with a combination of two Hurston Dynamics Dumbfire rocket pods and bespoke stealth armor, the ship is tooled for war. The Gamma is the racing variant with an improved power plant and extra engines, which allows the ship to accelerate faster than its cousins. The next ship is one of the more anticipated ones in the verse. The Pioneer. Taking inspiration from the manufacturing plants for Mustangs on Bremen, CNOU decided to build a flying factory with the intention of giving people the power to build their own custom outposts on distant worlds without having to rely on prefab manufacturers. Announced at IAE 2947, it was sold as a one-stop shop for any colonists looking to start a new life on the rugged frontier. 
The Nomad was released in 2950 as a hover skid open back cargo hauler. Embracing hover tech for the landing gear, the ship was designed as a middle ship between the beginner ships and the more professional starter ships like the Hull B. With a roomy 24 SCU of cargo, sealed personal cabin, inbuilt cargo tractor beam, and the weapons to protect it, the Nomad has found its place in many people's hearts in the verse for just how flexible it is. The last CNO ship available on the floor is the Hover Quad. Initially developed to pair with the Nomad, the Hover Quad is a hover snub similar to the Drake Dragonfly. Taking the technology developed for the Nomad to the next level, the Hover Quad was released in 2951 and took much of the hoverbike community by storm. It is very rugged and able to traverse very broken ground and is also able to be flown in space as an open-topped racer. The next company was founded as a mining supply company on Mars by Otis Broussard in 2337. Named Grey Cat after the nickname Otis had after his hair turned grey by the time he was 20. However, Grey Cat didn't rise to fame until his daughter Pippa took over. Pippa hired an old friend, Reuben Pardue, who had suffered a mining accident and had left his old job. Reuben and Pippa had known one another in college, and she knew just how brilliant he was. She needed someone to design and build new tech to be made in their new Angeli manufacturing plant, and he was the perfect candidate. This would prove crucial as Pardue not only produced new equipment, but equipment like the Ariel Mining Armor, Pyro Multitool, and PTV. These inventions catapulted the company into fame and wealth as they literally couldn't keep up with the demand for their products. Let's find out what Grey Cat has on the floor of this IAE. First is the Venerable Personal Transport Vehicle, or PTV. Designed originally as an armored mining buggy to allow for safe passage in dangerous mines, the teams of the factory that built the PTV enjoyed driving it up and down the factory floor so much, they changed the design by removing the armored roof and selling the vehicle as an all-purpose transport for those on the frontier and in teeming cities. Shortly after the success of the PTV, Greycat would develop the Remote Ore Collector, or ROC. It was small enough to fit in the cargo bay of many ships and powerful enough to laser mine and collect deposits that were too large for hand miners and too small for larger ones. It was successful enough to get another variant, the ROC Dual Seat or ROC DS, which grants control of the mining arm to an exterior operator. Next on the list is the Sport Terrain Vehicle or STV, which the community has affectionately dubbed the Steve. This off-road turning vehicle is the first from the ground up vehicle not designed with mining in mind. It has great top speed and is rugged enough to survive intense weather changes and other damage. It's in the same family as the PTV and the yet to be sold Utility Terrain Vehicle or UTV. Kruger was founded in 2558 by Ozel Kruger on her home planet of Borea in the Magnus system as a parts manufacturer. It started out landing big contracts with Bering and RSI, making everything from firing pins to crucial capital ship components. When business dried up in Magnus and its contracts were threatened due to increased pirate activity in Magnus, the company moved to the recently opened system of Castra in 2789. It was there that an off comment by an executive at a board meeting changed their direction. The executive joked that Kruger made all the parts for a gun except for the gun itself. This led to the creation of their first in-house weapon the ballistic Tiger Strike Gatling Gun, which became the stock loadout for the Aegis Avenger. This experiment worked so well that Kruger then pivoted to making their first ships, building the two ships we have on the floor today for RSI. While they remain a vital parts manufacturer, the futures may still be bright for this budding ship manufacturer. The ships we have from Kruger are the twin variants of the Constellation Snub Fighters, the P-52 Merlin and P-72 Archimedes. These ships were designed to be sold with the latest generation of RSI constellations to add range and firepower to the ships. While the P-52 is available on most Connie variants, the P-72 only comes with a luxury Connie Phoenix, though both can be purchased separately and can dock with all variants except for the Taurus. The P-52 features a miniature version of the Tiger Strike built into its chassis, while the P-72 drops this for more size 1 weapon mounts and an extra intake to become more of a racer. Both can dock with any constellation that has a docking cradle, meaning it's easy to swap one for the other. Founded in 2536 by a husband and wife team, Kuvaya Crosby and Aaron Dews, the story of the company's founding is both heartwarming and remarkable. Kuvaya and Aaron spent much of their time as teenagers together on the sandy planet of Yar. Having been brought close by a near-fatal incident of a sandstorm nearly claiming the life of Aaron's mother, but saved by Kuvaya and her family's old Crossfire Land Cruiser. Working on the old ground vehicle brought the two close, and due to unfulfilling careers, the pair decided to try to recapture the passion they had while working on the old Crossfire by attempting to build their own version of it 
from scratch and sell it on the market. They named their company Tumbril, after an old two-wheeled trailer they used for parts to make their first vehicle. The first vehicle was a sporty, rugged, and fast DX20. Sales initially didn't do well, but during the First Safarian War, the UPE military realized they needed a ground vehicle capable of carrying troops safely through a battlefield. The best on the market was the Tumbrel DX20. Because of its rugged construction and its enjoyment to drive, the DX20, renamed the Cyclone, found its way into many veterans' garages, kickstarting Tumbrel into becoming one of the top-earning companies in the UEE. Unfortunately, as time went on, the company began to lose the favor of the Messers and lost their military contracts. As the company tried to pivot into the private industry, they made one bad decision after another and were forced to close in 2862. However, in 2941, a Tumbrel fan and renowned entrepreneur, Terence Naban, purchased the brand and restarted it, releasing an updated Cyclone to the market to great success. Since then, Tumbrel has begun clawing back its reputation as being the premier ground transportation company of humanity. Let's look at what they've brought on the floor today for IAE. The oldest of these vehicles on offer from Tumbrel is the Cyclone. Built originally as the DX20 in 2536, this rugged ground transport made its name during the First Tavaran War, literally. The name Cyclone was the Army's designation for the vehicle. One of the events that made the Cyclone so beloved was early on in the war during the First Battle of the Argonne Chain. The UPE didn't have many trained or well-equipped soldiers early on, so when Colonel A.J. Crate found himself facing down a Tavaran tank division in 2943, the only advantage he had was several Cyclones and the high ground. Strategically luring the Tavarn towards his lines, he used the Cyclones to ambush the tanks in the mountainous terrain, and not only defeat them, but capture several of their tanks. This was an important victory, not only for the military, but for the morale of the home front and the reputation of the Cyclone to the public. Cyclones became synonymous with the UPE army, and by the end of the war, there were 27 factories producing the vehicle, meaning a Cyclone was coming out of the factory on average of every 35 seconds. Thus, after the war, there was a lot of surplus cyclones floating around, to say the least, and a lot of veterans and thrill-seekers looking to buy them. Despite the usage of the cyclone by the UEE throughout the Mezer era, the buggy never got associated publicly with the Mezers. In fact, a famous image of cyclones blockading Linton Mezer's palace during the Revolution gave the cyclone the reputation of being for the people. So it's not surprising when the Tumbrel brand was being brought back to life, the first product they made was an updated cyclone. The Cyclones on the floor come in six different varieties. The base Cyclone is almost identical to the military version with less armor and removed classified control surfaces. It has two seats and can hold one SCU of cargo in its rear compartment. The Cyclone AA is an anti-air variant and a nod to the defenders of Argonne Ridge with missiles capable of shooting both air and ground targets along with a small EMP. The Cyclone RC is a racing variant, which is stripped down and given a modified intake system to improve speed and handling. The Cyclone RN is a recon variant meant for prospectors and explorers who need access to fast and detailed in-person scans. It's armed with additional sensors and is configured for beacon deployment. The Cyclone TR is the infantry support assault variant, with the addition of a mounted size 1 gun on a turret capable of rotating 360 degrees for full horizontal coverage and additional gun racks for weapon storage for the crew. The final variant is the heavy assault model, the Cyclone MT. This variant is almost identical to the TR with the addition of four size 2 missiles capable of being operated by the gunner and designed to be used as an anti-armor vehicle. The last tumbrel vehicle on the floor today is the hero of the second Tavarin War, the Nova Tank. Built in 2604, this tank was designed to replace the Cyclone as the main attack vehicle of the UEE Army. Similarly to the Cyclone, the Nova managed to not only do just that, but become an icon to the public, especially after the Battle of Corin Pass in 2605, where three Novas held off a massive hidden Tavarin force for more than 16 hours before being relieved. In 2951, the Nova was updated and brought back into service, with many sold to private militia and security for frontier defense against the Van Duel. This tank has a crew of three, a bespoke size 5 main gun built by Herson Dynamics, a secondary remote turret with two size 3 hardpoints, an energy missile launcher, and internal crew stations and equipment storage. The final tumbrel vehicle on display is the soon-to-be-released Ranger Motorcycle. Designed to be compact, efficient, and fast, this two-wheeled vehicle comes in three different variants, courier-based CV, the racing-focused RC, and the combat-focused TR. The next manufacturer is one that works closely with Tumbrel today, 
but has its own revolutionary past, Crusader Industries. Created in 2799 out of Seraphim Systems, its founder, Augustin Lowe, was a former revolutionary who helped overthrow the Mezers. After the war toppled the dictators, he attempts to join the political world to make the changes he wanted, only to find out that money was needed to implement them. So he left politics and purchased a struggling shuttle manufacturer, renaming it Crusader Industries. The goal of Crusader Industries was to make money, but most of the money it earned was eventually given back to charity in order to see the changes that Auguste Dunlow wanted to make, making Crusader one of the most generous companies to charity organizations in the verse. After shipping issues caused by the cargo crisis of the early 29th century began to delay their shuttles to market, Crusader decided to build their own larger ships to bring their shuttles to market. This was the start of the company's rise in the shipping and transport industries that it remains dominant to this very day. In 2865, the company is one of three others tapped to purchase a planet in the Stanton system, with a gas giant of Stanton II becoming their new shipyards and headquarters. Let's see what ships Crusader has on offer on the floor today. The oldest Crusader ship is the Hercules M2 Starlifter. Built in 2821 for the military as a frontline transport, this heavy lift ship can carry up to 522 SCU of cargo, or several heavy vehicles, and put them right on the front lines. The ship is heavily armored, and with Crusader's reputation for ruggedness and easy to work on ships, it has become one of the favorites of the military cargo haulers. By 2940, the company will release two additional variants for the ship to the civilian market, while also making the M2 for sale for the general public. The A2 is a gunship version of the Hercules with reduced cargo capacity in exchange for more downward-facing weapons and massive bespoke bomb bays. The C2 is a stripped-down civilian hauler version of the M2, which sacrifices armor for increased load capacity. The LH-307 Genesis Starliner was designed and built by the new CEO of Crusader, Kelly Kaplan, sometime in the mid-29th century. It replaced the older models of Crusader's Saturn liners, being larger, more modern, and most importantly, highly customizable. The roll-and-go technique developed by Kaplan for the ship meant that custom versions of it could be built on the same assembly line as the standard versions, and thus allowing a company's fleet of generic and specialized Genesis to be delivered at the exact same time with the exact same parts interchangeable. The ship became so popular in the 29th century that the term going on crusade became a euphemism for vacationing. With a crew of two to eight, this people transport can hold a number of people or be configured to carry cargo, military equipment, racing ships and their teams, or even the Imperator themselves with their unique genesis called Imperator One. The Crusader Mercury Star Runner is a fast and nimble ship designed as a freight and data runner. Crusader decided to test the ship and give the public confidence in its ability by entering it into the Abel Baker Challenge, a brutal endurance race that changes every year, sometimes forcing ships to fly through toxic clouds or around dangerous ice storms, or even thread the needle between the binary stars themselves. The Star Runner didn't just finish this challenge once, but twice, making it the only ship known to have done so. It is in use by a number of private companies and even the military today to perform data running in light cargo operations. To that end, it has a large bank of servers to store data, as well as a somewhat large cargo hold. It also comes equipped with a luxurious crew compartment, two turrets, and a dedicated scanning station to receive and transmit data. The databanks even create a system of crawl spaces that have been known to block sensors, and as such, the ship is often used as a smuggling ship. The Ares Starfighter is a joint project between Bering and Crusader. More flying gun than ship, the Ares is built around the experimental SF-7 series of Bering weapons. While primarily an anti-capital ship fighter, with its massive size 7, there are two variants of the ship, the energy-focused Ion and the ballistic Gatling Inferno. The last ship from Crusader is also the most recent, the Spirit. While it's unknown how old the Spirit is, there are three variants, and it seems to function as a downsized version of the Hercules. The C-1 is a cargo variant with 48 SCU of cargo, enough space for a vehicle and bespoke tractor beams. The A-1 variant is a military bomber, equipped with twin racks of five size 5 bomb payloads. The E-1 is the luxury and liner variant, converted to hold six VIP passengers in their own private compartments with a panoramic view with custom portholes. Musashi Industrial and Starflight Concern, or MISC, was founded on Saisei in the Centauri system in 2805. They were formed from a merger of Hato Electronics and the Musashi Lifestyle Design Unit of Acorn Limited. 
this merger took advantage of Hato's extensive production facilities and Musashi's reputation for design genius. The main reason for its founding was the formation of their heavy industries division, also known as Miss Kai, to take advantage of the cargo crisis of the 29th century. The company's heavy industry division was key to the early success of MISC, creating ships like the Whole Series and the Starfarer, which attracted the attention of the Xi'an and landed them a trade deal for valuable Xi'an technology. Today, the company is known for heavy-duty, industrial, and well-made ships, and ergonomic, modular, and detailed production facilities, both which can be found all over the verse. Let's look at what's on offer from MISC on the floor today. Now, this is slightly confusing as to the dates, but according to lore, the first ship that Misk made was the whole series in 2802, three years before it was formed. This could be because the ship was designed and launched by Musashi Lifestyle Design, but, but didn't have enough production facilities to keep up with demand, thus the merger with Hato Electronics. Nevertheless, the hull A, B, C, and D were built as sturdy, modular hulls. Their size range allowed just about anyone to purchase the best one for their needs. The fact that each ship is nearly identical, with slight variations as the size increases, made these ships incredibly easy to mass produce. This combination was key to the whole series' success. The ships were so successful that dockyards and cargo processes began to form around the ship. Several new companies were founded to support this change, and even the Argo MPUV would see a shift to support loading and unloading these freighters. The holes nearly single-handedly ended the cargo crisis, though it would take another 70 years to truly abate. In 2820, after nearly two decades of success, MISC released the Hull E, the de facto super freighter and king of cargo even to this day. Sadly, we only have the smallest of this series on the floor today, the Hull A. Still, this intro freighter holds an impressive amount of cargo for its size, 64 SCU. This is owed to the unique plates that lock cargo to the exterior. These plates are attached to a spindle that can retract and collapse into the ship itself, allowing the whole series to transform depending on if it's hauling cargo or not. The next ship from MISC is the Starfarer. Built in 2780, this ship was the result of interior research from MISC itself on the major bottlenecks which faced human space expansion. The answer they came up with was fuel transport. Most fuel ships of the late 29th century were massive super tankers, which were very prone to accidents and unable to land on planets as their fuel tanks were exposed to vacuum. That meant the fuel transport was unreliable and slow. This was especially worrisome for the UEE Navy, who relied on these fuel shipments to keep fighting. Thus, MISC developed their own tanker-slash-refueler with safety in mind. The Starfarer The main design that separated the Starfarer from its contemporaries was how it held its fuel, with the tanks protected by armor and welded to the superstructure to increase security. It has two onboard refineries, that, coupled with the massive intakes in the front, allow the ship to collect and process free hydrogen into fuel. All of this, combined with a boom arm for refueling smaller ships on the go, has made the ship very efficient at its role, and a common sight for crews of stranded ships who need to refuel on the go. While initially rejected to build a militarized version of the Starfarer, MISC realized the reason for this rejection was their lack of experience with military contracts, so they turned to another company with extensive experience in this process, Aegis Dynamics to officially build their military Starfarer to get around government bureaucracy, which worked. This ship would be named the Starfarer Gemini and enter service in 2915. Swapping out the intake for large missile pods, larger defensive turret, and thicker armor, this ship soon began service along the Vandal front to keep the fighter squadrons in the fight and on patrol longer. The Endeavor was a ship that was wrought with chaos from its onset. MISC set out to build a scientific research and medical ship and tasked a group of whole series and Starfarer designers to create the design. However, both teams had a hard time agreeing on the design, so instead of a single ship, they built a frame and several modules to swap out depending on the need of the customer buying the ship. This makes it really several ships in one, with the base being three separate stages, the explorer cab, the workshop, and the drive, along with traditional modules able to be added on. Of these, there are biodomes, service and crew quarters, general research, general science, medical bay, and landing bay. With the success of the Starfarer, MISC managed to get the attention of the Giand, who were impressed with the forward thinking and planning of MISC. Thus, representatives from Aopoa approached them to offer a trade in 2910. The Giand would get the plans for the whole series and some of its design tech, along with human engineers and pilots to teach them how the ship worked. And MISC would get Giand thruster designs, parts, and assistance from scientists on loan from Aopoa. The resulting trade would help boost the development of the next ship of MISC's fleet, the Freelancer. Built in 2915, this smaller line of space pickup trucks 
allowed for the average person to get their hands on the now legendary MISC brand. The added bonus being the addition of Xeon Thruster Tech into the ship itself. The base freelancer has 66 SCU of cargo, four size three gimbaled weapons, a crew of one to three, and crew quarters to support four people. The addition of Xeon Tech made the ship's engines hyper-efficient and gave the ship an impressive range for its size. This same aspect of the ship allowed MISC to develop other purpose-built variants of the Freelancer, including the long-range explorer Durr, which has gone on to discover many jump points, the militarized MISC, which added two size 5 missile racks built into the fuselage, and the heavy cargo MAX, which doubles the cargo capacity. Following the success of the Freelancer, MISC began to work on Project Cold Boot, a study on what role-specific ships they could build using the same factory lines as the Freelancer. This would lead to the Prospector in 2925, which, while not using the Freelancer base hull, borrowed heavily from its design, so any Freelancer pilot would instantly feel at home behind the controls. While not being able to carry bulk storage or processing like other mining vessels, the Prospectors become the default beginning ship for any miner in the verse. The Prospector has a crew of one, a size one mining laser, a powerful scanner, living quarters, detachable saddlebags, and two size one weapons for defense. The ship would gain fame when one of the first prospectors would discover the Chessex Load, a massive discovery of previously ignored raw materials on Farron 2, which made the pilot, Chloe Rasnick, a fortune overnight. This would boost the sales of the ship dramatically as a result. The Expanse is the end result of follow-up surveys of prospector owners. The owners cited the small cargo capacity and the reliance they had on third-party refining sites as being the major issue that held them back from being able to advance beyond their prospector into more efficient multi-crew mining ships. Thus, the Expanse was built explicitly to pair with the prospector as a minor investment that could greatly increase the profitability of smaller mining operations. The Expanse follows the MISC standard layout theory with adaptations for movement and transfer of ores, which is done externally via tractor beams. The ship's six dedicated reactors can process different refining actions at the same time, and even refine salvage material and scrap into usable commodities. The Reliant is the ultimate fusion of Xi'an design and human ingenuity. It began life as Project Boomerang in 2946, after being buoyed by the successful ad campaign around the latest generation of Freelancer, noting how many pilots were looking for smaller, single-person starter ships. This would lead to the Reliant, built explicitly to compete with other introductory ships like the Mustang and the Aurora, with the twist of it being able to be operated by one or two crew, unlike the other starters which are exclusively solo operated. This ship is covered in Gion technology, from its moving cockpit, omnidirectional thrusters, and advanced Gion metal composites, the ship comes with four versions, with the standard being the Core, a hauler which carries six SCU of cargo. The Mako is the news van variant, which has state-of-the-art image enhancement suite and turret-mounted optics and a bespoke broadcasting equipment. The Sen is the science and explorer variant, with its onboard scanner suite and increased scanner resolution and range over other ships of its type. The last variation is the Tana, a fighter built with extra weapons. The Razor is part of one of the oldest running designs in MISC history. Initially began by CEO Corey Desmond as a project to expand out of exclusively heavy industrial ships in 2883, its first incarnation was the MISC Daedalus, which participated in the first Murray Cup on green, but did not win. After the deal with Aopoa in 2910, MISC revisited the idea to develop what would become the MISC Razor in 2940. This would initially lead to the release of the ship in 2947, when the Razor managed a Murray Cup berth. The key to the Razor's success is the Proteus system, a cutting-edge fuel collection system which allows the ship to boost quicker with the aid of Xi'an technology. It's also one of the fastest ships in the verse, while also having minor protection with two size 2 hardpoints. With its release in 2947, the Razor was also given two variants. The LX is an overclocked engine version of the ship, which trades in maneuverability for straight-line speed. The EX is a stealth variant, which has seen use by the advocacy for surveillance and extraction operations, and is covered in signature-reducing materials and equipped with stealth components. The last offering from MISC is the Odyssey, a flying station first introduced at IAE 2951. It was made for two reasons. The first being the increased sales and interest in civilian exploration after the success of the civilian Carrick model, and the second was to correct the botched launch of the Endeavour. The Odyssey focuses on better overall defense than the Endeavour, but built around the same focused pod design philosophy of the Starfarer. The unique part of this ship is its mining and refinery equipment, 
which can be used in tandem with its exploration features, allowing a six-person crew to not only chart new stars, but also begin taking advantage of its resources. RSI is the oldest company in the verse. Founded way back in 2038 on Earth, it's responsible for the creation of the first quantum drive, the first atmospheric processor, and the first commercially available ship, the Zeus. The goals of the company have always been to learn from the past, reach for the future, fuel innovations, cultivate talent, and always be relevant. They remain a juggernaut in the industry, with their ships and creations being the core of modern space travel. From the smallest beginner ships to the mightiest ships of the UEE fleet, RSI remains the most important spaceship manufacturer of humanity today. Let's have a look at what's from RSI on the floor today. The oldest ship available from RSI's fleet is the Perseus. Built in 2520, this is the oldest ship still flyable in the game today, though not quite released. The Perseus is the first in a line of modernized UPE-designed ships built to deal with the modern realities of growing human expansion. It is a patrol gunship designed to intimidate as much as destroy its opposition. During its first action, it was called out to help put down the unified currency riots on Jata, which had grown out of control. When a single Perseus arrived in orbit, the rioters surrendered or fled, having never seen a ship like it before. Since then, the Perseus has had a long history of patrolling the border between human and Xi'an space, while also having distinguished itself in the two Tavaran Wars. However, by the 27th century, the UEE was looking to replace the, at the time, century-old ship, but the designer of the ship to replace it, Leonard Case, died in an aerospace accident. Thus, the Perseus would continue its role, though stopped being produced in 2860 and slowly began to be phased out. This changed when the last few Perseuses were called back into action during the Battle of Oberon in 2946. It was there that the ancient powerhouse proved how useful it was, with the UES Achilles single-handedly holding a vital position of the line against several Vanduul waves managing to take down two destroyers before being beyond repair. This impressed Admiral Bishop so much that he personally requested that RSI began building the Perseus once more, which they have done not only for the military, but the civilian market as well. Now, the ship itself is a relic of ship design, which has ironically boomeranged back to becoming in vogue. When the Perseus was first launched, humanity didn't have access to shields that could fit on ships of its size. The power plant was not powerful enough to support one, so it was heavily over-armored by today's standards and given an automated point defense turret to take care of missiles and torpedoes. Since then, it has been retrofitted to carry modern shields, but it hasn't lost its armor. The ship also has a low requirement of personnel of only 1 to 6, making it very easy to crew. The key to the success of the ship in combat is its two twin-size 7 turrets, dubbed subcap slayers by its crews. These are devastating weapons against most ships below capital class, and can still put out severe hurt on capital ships in large numbers, as the SF-7 on the Ares has shown. The next oldest ship of the RSI fleet is the Constellation. First built in 2712, this ship series is one of the most popular larger multi-crew ships in the verse, due to it being very flexible. It has seen four updates over the years, and that trend is likely not going to stop anytime soon. The base version of the Kani is the Andromeda, a multifunctional ship capable of combat, exploration, and cargo hauling. Like most Kani's, the Andromeda is also fitted with a docking cradle for a Kruger snub ship and comes standard with a P-52 Merlin. It requires a crew of three, comes with two turrets, and four pilot-controlled size 4 weapons, along with blistering 24 missiles. It has a deployable cargo hold that can hold a rover or 96 SCU of cargo. The ship also comes in many variants. The Taurus was first introduced as the Connie Light in 2815 with the Mark II series of Connies. This is a stripped down cargo variant of the ship and the only Connie not to support a snub today, replacing the docking area with a shielded cargo hold. The Aquila is a exploration variant of the ship. It has a unique larger bridge design, replaces one of the turrets for a dedicated science station, jump point navigation sensors, and comes standard with an Ursa rover for increased exploration on planets and moons. The last variant of the Kani is the Luxury Phoenix. First introduced in 2944, this ship got its inspiration from a Spectrum series called Spacecraft of the Elite, which showed off the custom modifications of ships of the rich and powerful. These designs inspired the Kani team to attempt to make their own luxury conversion of the ship for the market. Though delays and issues with the Mark III hull, the ship would eventually release with the new Mark IV line. This ship remains a Kani at heart, but with a total conversion of the midsection for entertainment and luxury, sporting a bar, hot tub, 
luxurious master bedroom, two guest bedrooms, and the luxury Lynx Rover, and the racing version of the Kruger Snub, the P-72 Archimedes. The Aurora is the iconic ship of the RSI fleet, the descendant of the famed X-7, the first ship to navigate a jump point and return safely. It is most people's first ship in the verse. It's rugged, easy to fly, easy to maintain, and incredibly cheap to purchase. While it's unknown just how old the ship is, ships with its name made by RSI date back centuries, though the true ancestor of the ship was the RSI Starbright, which dates back to at least 2587. The ship also comes in many variations to meet the needs of just about anyone who might fly one. The base version is the ES, or Essential, which is the true cut-down budget version of the Aurora. The next more common ship is the MR, or Mark, designed for light combat and hauling. The ship has a slightly better cooling than its cousins and comes standard with three SCU of cargo, which most Connies do have. The CL or Clipper is the light transport version with an increased cargo capacity of six SCU. The LX or Deluxe is the luxury variant of the Aurora series, which is a standard MR but with a leather pilot's chair. The last variant is the true combat variant known as the LN or Legionnaire with larger weapons and missile hardpoints and better starter shield generator. The Apollo is the gold standard for medevac and rapid emergency response. First built in the 28th century, this ship has earned its name on the battlefield and in daily life alike. The ship comes standard with VTOL thrusters and the shock balance system to keep the rescue personnel stable while tending to the wounded. It features two modular med bays that allow it to change out the interior of each bay to three tier three, two tier two, or one tier one med bed. This allows the ship to be flexible depending on what it's being asked to do, patrol, ambulance, or emergency response. It also comes equipped with two med lift semi-automated emergency extraction pods, able to remotely retrieve patients without risking the crew. The other variant of the ship is known as the Medevac, which includes superior armor and missile racks, and is based on the main ship from the Astromedic series of movies. Beginning in 2907, the movies center around a medical team, Chloe Hansen and Rick Revere, who work on an Apollo named Kathira. The series has at least six installments and a video game. It is still widely popular even in the mid-30th century, so as a tribute, the Medevac was produced with the latest line of Apollos in 2948. The Ursa Rover is a civilian modification of the UEE Marine RDV or Rapid Deployment Vehicle. It has six tires and four SCU capacity or up to four passengers with a driver and co-driver who can operate the vehicle or man the remote turret. It was built for the civilian market as an exploration vehicle alongside the Mark IV Connies, specifically the exploration-based Aquila, but comes standard with ships like the Carrick as well. The Polaris is a Corvette-class capital ship designed as the spiritual successor to the Perseus. Built explicitly with combating the Vanduul in mind, the ship is equipped with a small fighter bay, medical bay, four capital-class ship-killer torpedo bays, and a ship's mess. This ship is designed to go longer and hit harder than any other ship in its class, being mostly self-sustaining. It is also the perfect ship for border and system patrols. The ship was fast-tracked after the attack on Vega by the Van Duel and offered for sale for, to the civilian populace through the Militia Mobilization Initiative. While it's unknown when the Mantis was first produced, we know the latest one is a significant upgrade to quantum enforcement systems. The QED, or quantum enforcement device of the ship, is designed to snare ships out of quantum and keep them from engaging it once they're out. The Mantis goes even further by being able to track targets at long range with its quantum markers. The Scorpius is the latest military ship on offer from RSI. Likely beginning life as the Black Widow, it lost to the F-8 Lightning in 2935, but has found its way into military service through extensive military and civilian testing. This is a heavy two-seater fighter with eight size three weapon hardpoints and 16 size two missiles. The secondary seat operates the remote turret, which has a unique rail system that allows the gun to traverse to fire behind or in front of the ship with its four size three weapons. Its X-Wing design even folds back for easier storage when landed, making it an excellent carrier fighter. The latest offering from RSI is the Galaxy. This is a large industry ship with its main focus being around the modular midsection, which could be swapped out for a cargo bay, refinery, or medical module. It also has an extra small hangar that can double as a cargo bay and powerful tractors built into the cargo and refinery modules to allow for easier movement. That is what was on offer here on the floor of IAE 2952. 
If you haven't already signed up for Star Citizen, then be sure to use the referral code on screen now or in the description when you sign up. I'd like to thank you for watching and remind you to subscribe for more lore videos of Star Citizen and other sci-fi games. If you enjoyed the video, think about leaving a like. If you really want to help out the channel, think about becoming a YouTube member or Patreon. For now, let me know your favorite ship and manufacturer on the floor this year and what you'd like to learn more about in the comments below. As always, remember, Existoria at Astra.